Chapter 27, Camps 5 and 6. Because of our late start, I thought Camp 4 was close, but we didn't get to the dreaded wall leading up to it until well after dark. We're climbing the wall at night, I asked, shocked. Zopa took off his mask. It's the only way to get into Camp 4 unnoticed. Everyone will be asleep. They went, that would be, they would be in their tents all right. The wind was howling and it hadn't stopped snowing all day. But from our last experience, I knew they wouldn't be sleeping. If they were like me, when I was up there, they would be lying in their sleeping bags, wondering if they had enough air to keep them alive through the night. The last time we were here, it took me over five hours to reach the top and I nearly gave up on the way. The weather was worse now and it was dark. Yogi and Yash had thrown a rope over the side for us to use. You'll need headlamps, Zopa said. Right, I said. Slide the Junar up the rope. Step, breathe, Junar, step, Jumar. Think, look up, think again, step, rest, 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 hug the wall, pray. The same routine, but in a strange way, the climb was easier, or at least less scary with the headlamp. The light kept me, from fo kept me focused on the ice and rock in front of me. I had no idea where the top or the bottom was until a light appeared at the edge about 10 feet above me. It was Yogi, although it was hard to tell, bundled up like he was, I managed to get to the top without his having to grab me. As I rested on my knees trying to catch my breath and not puke, I looked at my watch. I had climbed the wall in less than five hours this time. 15 minutes later, Sunjo came over the top, looking like he was about to pass out. I shouted in his ear that he had made it up the wall a half hour faster than he had the last time. This seemed to cheer him up. He managed to get to his feet. Zopa was last. He was in terrible shape. It took all three of us to pull him over the edge. And when we got him there, he didn't move. I checked his oxygen tank. It was empty. Yogi hurried off and came back with a fresh tank and yash. They got the oath flowing and carried Zopa to their tent. After an hour or so, he recovered enough to open his eyes and drink something. A few minutes later, he asked the brothers if they had heard anything from Josh. The Chinese soldier climbers had reached ABC that afternoon and were planning to stay there a day or two before climbing to Camp 4. They had checked everyone's papers and searched all the tents. The climbers at ABC said the soldiers were in great shape and had made terrific time, and there was no doubt they were going to try for the summit. This seemed like the worst possible news, but Zopa didn't seem at all disturbed by it. You will be a day ahead of them. Tomorrow, tonight and tomorrow you will rest. The following morning before light, you'll be climbed to Camp 5. What about you, Sun Joe asked. Do you really think they're going to be worried about a sick old monk when they get up here? If they really are such good climbers, the soldiers with, will all want to try for the summit. Which of them will stay behind to escort the old man down the mountain? He gave a wheezy laugh. By the time they get back here, I will be gone. Why can't we just go to Camp 5 when it gets light, I asked. We'll just be that much further ahead of the soldiers. There will be a storm in a few hours, Zopa answered. Tomorrow morning is your window. The storm hit us mid-morning. If we had left when I wanted, we would have been halfway to Camp 5, and we would have died along with the three campers who did leave that climbers who did leave that morning. None of them made it to Camp 5, and nobody could help them. The weather was too severe. I tried to write in my moleskin and found that I couldn't concentrate long enough to string more than two or three words together at a time. After a while, I gave up and managed to get a little sleep. And so did Sunjo, mostly because there was nothing else to do but lie in the tent. Zopa didn't want us wandering around camp, not that we had the energy, and the storm was so bad, everyone was hunkered down waiting for it to stop. About eight o'clock that night, it did, suddenly. One moment the wind and snow were threatened to blow our tent over, the next moment it was perfectly calm. I stuck my head outside the tent along with everybody else in camp and saw a perfectly clear sky overhead scattered with bright stars. Yash left for camp five three hours ahead of us to get the camp ready. Yogi stuck his head into our tent an hour before we were to leave and told us to pack our gear. We weren't taking much with us. Most of what we needed would be waiting for us at camp five. Yogi and Yash had hauled it up the last time we were at camp four. Before we took off, we checked on Zopa. He was sitting up drinking a mug of tea. He was off the O's and some of the color had returned to his face, but he still looked pretty weak. Speed is everything now. If you stay in the death zone too long, you will die. If you don't reach the stomach by 1.35 the day you leave Camp 6, I have asked Yogi and Yash to turn you around. 
It is better to get caught by the Chinese than it is to die on the mountain. This seemed to contradict his plan to get Sun Zhou over the top to safety. But he was right. From Camp 6, you have to reach the summit and return in about 18 hours. Oxygen or not, there was a limit to how long you could survive above Camp 6. If we made the summit, we would have to reach the top camp on the other side in 18 hours. Have Yogi and Yash been to the summit, I asked. It had been a, been a question on my mind since Zopa had announced that he wasn't taking us there himself. Of course, Zopa said three times. Good, I said. Does Josh know you're not coming with us? Zopa shook his head, then gave us a blessing and said, I'll see you both in Kathmandu. Now go. It was clear and bitterly cold as we left the dark camp and started the north ridge to the summit. It was hard to keep my excitement in check. A night at Camp 5, a night at Camp 6, then the top of the world. It was more of a forced march to Camp 5 than a climb. We hooked onto a series of fixed ropes. Yogi had set the pace. I tried a regime of 12 steps, a minute of gasping to recover, then another 12 steps. After an hour, it was down to about eight steps and I'm not sure how many minutes to recover. It's hard to believe that some climbers have made the summit without any supplemental O's at all. Josh was one of them, and although I was suspected on this trip he would be sucking down the O's if it, for no other reason than to stay sharp so he didn't lose one of his clients. The sun came up and gave up the best view of Everest's pyramidal s summit yet. It was enormous. Coming off the top was a disk of ice crystals across the blue sky. The sight inspired my sluggish brain to remember the camera, which I'd put in my pocket before we left Camp 4. I shouted ahead to Sunjo to wait up, but he was, and he, which he was more than happy to do. When I got to him, I took off my outer mittens, pushed to the record button, and tried to imitate JR as best I could. What are you feeling right now, I asked. You're less than a mile from the highest point on Earth. I had him framed perfectly against the summit. Frightened, Sunjo said, and hopeful, and worried about my grandfather. I had no idea it would be this hard. That's about all my unmittened fingers could take. I can film you now if you like. Nah, that's all right. We have to keep moving. About half an hour later, we saw our first corpse. Sunjo saw it first, and I walked up to him as he was staring down at it. Yogi has breezed by as if he hadn't noticed, but I bet he had. It was a woman, and about 50 feet away was another corpse, but I couldn't tell because it was lying face down. I had never seen a dead person, let alone a frozen dead person. She looked more like a wax figure than a former human being, and in a way, this was even more disturbing to me. She had been there a while if her shredded clothes were any indication. It looked like she'd died sitting up and had fallen over to side. She, only ha she was only a few hours from her tent at Camp 4. I'm not sure how long we stood there staring, and we would have stayed there longer if Yogi hadn't shouted for us to hurry up. After five more corpses, I stopped looking. At noon, we came to a steeper part of the North Ridge. It was much colder. The fixed ropes were frozen and Sherpas were chipping shallow steps into the ice to make it easier to climb. Yogi waited for us to catch to him. He pointed to the tents down at Camp 4 and then to tents at Camp 5 and said something in Nepalese. Halfway, Sanjo translated, six hours to go. To make that six hours worse, the wind picked up. We had to bend over as we climbed and we weren't, so we weren't blown away off the ridge. My initial excitement was long gone. I think the only thing that kept me going were the O's waiting for me up ahead. I don't know what kept Sunjo going, probably the Chinese climbers behind him and freedom ahead. We got to Camp 5 a little before 7, 25,196 feet. It seemed impossible that we could ever go any further. It was the end of the world, and it really wasn't a camp. It was a series of clear platforms stretching up the North Ridge for at least a quarter mile with absolutely no shelter from the howling wind. The big flat platforms could hold five or six tents, the small platforms one or two. Several of the platforms had tents on them, but it was hard to say how many people were up there. I suspected most of the tents were waiting for climbers coming up from Camp 4 or down from Camp 6 after their summit attempt. Our tiny rubble pile was just enough for two tents pitched on the garbage of the former occupants. Yash had boiling water for tea, but what I was interested in was the mask strapped to his face, pumping O's into his lungs. He was moving twice as fast as we were. I grabbed a tank from the pile, pulled the mask out of, the, out of my pack, hooked it up, and stuck it on my face. The feeling I had with the first lung full of oxygen is indescribable. Bliss is about as close as I can, but it was way beyond that. 
Yash had helped Sunjo up his rig, but he'd got it on. We were going to live. We might even make it to the summit. The Chinese are heading up to Camp 4 tomorrow, one of the climbers on ABC told Josh. You're kidding, Josh said. They, how are they acclimatized? What about acclimatization? These guys are acclimated. One of our climbers speaks a little Chinese, and they told her they were in K2 when they were ordered to come here. They haven't said it, but I think they're coming down until they take a shot at the summit. They're like climbing machines. When are you heading up? The day after tomorrow, if the weather's good, Josh answered. I was going to hold off a little longer, but I took my people out for a climb today, and they all did pretty well. The virus seems to have run its course. We're heading to Camp 4 in the morning. We'll see you on the way back down. Good luck. Out. This was probably the last transmission we would hear. I wondered if Josh would be worried if he didn't pass me on his way up. I asked Sanjo how he was doing. The oxygen helps, but I'm still concerned. I had a lot of trouble today. You're not the only one. It's hard up here. I have to make it for my sisters and my mother. Those were reasons to risk your life, I thought. But why was I doing it? For Josh's business? For my ego? Now that my brain had oxygen, I found myself really missing the two Ps, my mom and even Roth. This got me to thinking about the corpses we saw on the way up here. Who had left them behind? They were very uncomfortable questions to fall asleep on. The oxygen was wonderful, but the masks were a pain in the butt to sleep in. It was hard to find a position where the straps didn't dig into your face. Also, the exhaust system stank. Small pools of icy slime collected on the mouthpiece valve. And when I moved my head, slushy, slush, slushy spit ran down my neck. Because of this, Sunjo and I were up early. We checked and rechecked our gear. Leaving something behind like a spare headlamp battery or a glove could be a death sentence. Yogi took the lead this time, leaving Yash to take, up, take us up to Camp 6. Our first obstacle was a steep snow field that we had a four point with ice axes and crampons. Stupidly, I assumed now that we were on O's, it would be like climbing at sea level. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. By the time we reached the top of the snowfield, my lungs were screaming for air. I thought that something was the matter with my mask and the tank had run out of oxygen, but everything was working perfectly. The two liters of oxygen didn't simulate sea level. It simply allowed me to stay alive above 25,000 feet. And there was a huge difference between lying in a tent doing nothing and climbing a steep snowfield on all fours. I took the little camera out and filled Sunjo crabbing his way to me. But the expression on his face I could see was having the same O oh, revelation I just had. I don't think I can make it, he gasped. I'm serious. Peek, this is too much. We just pushed too hard going up the field. We just have to pace ourselves. He nodded, but there was fear in his eye, and I knew exactly how he felt. We passed another three or four corpses on the way up. A few hours later, I stopped to rest and looked at my altimeter watch. We had just passed 26,000 feet, and we were officially in the death zone. Every minute from now on, we were dying a little. We stumbled into Camp 6 like three zombies. Yogi's had the tent set up, and he didn't look much better than we did. He told Sanjo to get our stove going to boil snow and drink as much water as we could. The very idea of drinking or eating anything made my stomach lurch. I turned on the video camera and saw Sanjo lighting the stove, or trying to light the stove. It must have taken him 50 strokes to get the cigarette lighter going in thin air. When it finally ignited, his thumb was bleeding like he had sliced it with a knife. We gagged down as much food and water as we could, then wrapped in our sleeping bags to wait. Sleep was out of the question. The inside of the tent was filled with a thin layer of frost from our breath. Every time one of us moved, the freezing crystals fell on our faces. They say that when you die, your life flashes before your eyes. Mine was passing before my eyes in slow motion like a horror movie. I think it was the corpses that did it. I thought of mom falling off that wall, the boy I'd never met falling the flat iron building, Sunjo hanging by a thread on that ice wall, and Sunjo's father saving my father, then dying of a heart failure. The only thing that stopped that depressing playback was the tent flap opening and the appearance of Yogi's mass face. We go, he said. Well, not quite, it was more like, we get go ready to go. They made us drink more water and then told us to do our toilet, which is a lot easier than said than done at 30 degrees below zero. Two hours later, we were ready. We left for the summit of Mount Everest. I looked at my watch. It was 1.35 a.m. We had 12 hours to get there.